We want to thank our listeners for your support in making this podcast possible. Blue Buddha Productions is listener-funded, and your contributions allow us to continue bringing you remarkable content like this. If you would like to support us, you can donate through PayPal at elliot.bluebuddhaproductions at gmail.com. Remember there is only one L and one T in Elliot. Your generosity helps us create more transformative experiences for you to enjoy. Thank you for being a part of our journey. Now, let's immerse ourselves in the extraordinary world of the Zoom sessions with your host Elliot Goldstein, brought to you by Blue Buddha Productions. Joining us on the show is a true maestro of the mixing console, a wizard in the realm of sound, and a legend in the industry. He's worked with some of the biggest names in music, making their sonic dreams come to life. Please welcome the one and only, Oz Fritz. Without further ado, let's dive deep into the world of sound with Oz. But before we do, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, leave us a rating, and share this podcast with your fellow sound aficionados. Now, let's get this episode rolling. So you're doing okay? Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, I mean, it's up and down. It's a, you know, a struggle. I had my uh, main three um, income streams cut off last year. So I, things have been juggling a bit. But What's, um, What was that? Well, um, you know, I used to do shows with Bill Laswell, and and that didn't happen this summer. Um, And then I had a studio I worked at a lot called Prairie Sun, where I worked with Tom Waits. And that had to close at the end of uh, June 2022, um, because the guy um, jacked up the rent so high it wasn't sustainable. And then there's a local studio that I did a lot of work at, and... um, uh, one of the owners passed away in uh, 2022. Um, they're still keeping it going, but it, it hasn't quite bounced back yet. Right. So things come in, you know, other one door closes, other ones open. And, um, sure. yeah, you know, you go, you, I go through cycles. I was very slow um, May, June and July, but it's it's picking up now. Good. I spoke to Bill a couple of days ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he um, he's getting sounds like he's getting a little stronger. Yeah, I think I think he's bouncing back. They they found a way to save uh, Orange, his studio, yeah, um, from going under. That was very close to the brink. Yeah. And, um, so I'm optimistic he's going to bounce back and that there's going to be more music. Um, yeah. He's, a- as, he's as fiery as ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know he he. Um, I think he's having some mobility issues, but um, yes, he's definitely. Um, he sounds like the old Bill again, anyway. Yeah, no, I don't think he's ready to retire and give it up. I think, you know, you're going to see a new chapter once he yeah. gets on his feet. Um, yeah, I do too. I just mastered a uh, old concert that he played in, uh, the Ginger Baker Band. Um, yeah, that was just released? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mastered that last week and they put it out right away. Wow. And uh, Bill's working on another Baker project, right? I'm not sure. You, you you might know more than I do about that. That may be the one. That might be the one he's telling me about. He said he was working on a Baker project. That okay. might be the one. I know he's had a Miles Davis project in the works. No, that that's done. I mean, that I, I was afraid. I was hesitant to mention that because there's there. Um, it's it's mind blowing. I mean, the world needs to hear it. Um, there's a hold up with the Miles Davis estate. Um, okay. The record company is ready to go. It's all you know, beautiful, but um, yeah, so hopefully they can get that worked out. I think, you know, I, I told them, I told Bill, you know, I thought um, uh, they're working against Miles Davis's legacy. I mean, it's not what Miles would have wanted because he was about music and this is an incredible, um, you know, they were basically lost tapes of, of his. I don't know if you right. know the whole story about it, but. Um, yeah, no, he told me, he told me, you know, that it would, yeah. you know, he kind of gave me the background. Well, and yeah. he's been working on that for a couple of years now. Well, it's been done, I know, for at least um, maybe a year and a half. I don't think yeah. he's been that long on it. Um, right, 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 right. But he's been, he's been talking about it since COVID. Yeah, yeah. You know, I know it's during COVID he was working on that in Baker. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then um, I think Last Poets. Oh, right. Happening. Yeah. And then, uh, then Sam Morrison. Okay. You know Sam? I don't know him, no. Sam actually was in one of the later uh, Miles Davis bands. Okay. 
great sax player. Uh, Bill's been uh, working on his stuff now since COVID as well. I just hung up with Sam a few minutes ago. Uh-huh. And, and um, yeah, that's going to be out soon, too. Oh, great. Pretty, pretty interesting uh, piece as well. Yeah. In fact, um, what's his name? Uh, uh, Sonny uh, Fortune was um, uh, Miles. Uh, uh, Sam replaced Sonny in the Miles Davis band towards the end. Okay. That was the hookup there. And uh, Miles loved his work. He said he's like the Coltrane. Right. You know? And um, anyway, so um, what do you, so besides that, what are you working on? What are you doing? Well, um, I have a new release out that I recorded and mixed called Sergeant Splendor. It's with a guy named Eric McFadden. Oh, and okay. He, I don't know if you know Eric. He's played yeah. with, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. One of my favorite people to work with. His It's with him and his partner, Kate Vargas. They're the two uh, principals in the band. Um, they had Paolo Baldi drumming for them. Paolo is well, yeah. the band Cake. And um, yeah, it's just it's kind of like the New Orleans, uh, dirty, funky rock type of stuff. They did a it's all originals. They did a cover of uh, Chelsea Hotel, oh. the Leonard Cohen song. Yeah it's originals and i do a lot of local stuff um there's a couple of great singer songwriters i recorded and produced uh one's named cassidy joy a song called picture frame and i just finished one with a woman named Catherine schultz um a song called let this be enough um there's my client from holland named rude howling we we mixed his record up in uh, a guy named tucker martin do you know tucker no Oh, he's interesting guy. He's he's kind of the go to alternative music producer of the Pacific Northwest. I would say he's worked with My Morning Jacket, done oh. tons of records with Bill Frizzell. Sure. Um, he's worked with the guys from REM. Um, but T- Tucker Martin is an interesting connection because he's the brother of a guy named Lang Martin. And Lang Martin used to be my assistant at Greenpoint with Bill okay. Laswell. Sure. And um, so anyway, we because of Prairie Sun, the studio I worked at closed and we went up to Portland and mixed uh, Rude's album, which is called Accidental Pictures. What I have coming up, there's a um, Belgian, uh, they're sort of out of the Belgian free jazz um, arena. They that's an old, you know, ultimately comes from a Laswell connection because they're associated with a guy or um, band called. Um, Flat Earth Society, which the leader of that, uh, Peter is his first name. And and he, Bill, produced a couple of records with him called, they were called Cross-Legged Sally or Ex-Legged Sally. Um, so I got that starting next month. And just a lot of, um, you know, I do mixing for remote people. A guy named Roger Cloud, who's a, uh, he's a really great uh, electrical and microphone designer, but he also does music. Mm-hmm. um you know so I, d- I do mixes for people so it's just kind of scrambling it's cool. the business has really changed because it used to be you would work on one project for a few weeks right and then you'd go to another project now i'm like juggling half a dozen projects at once well you know i also spoke to Raldo. okay Raldo Brinocchi. yeah uh, he he said hi too by the way right on before yeah. i forget yeah great guy Raldo's a great guy he is a great guy. Yeah, he's he's um, he's a real go getter in terms of uh, collaboration. Like he's yes. not afraid to call someone up. That's how he met Bill. Just you know, calling him yeah. out of the blue. Yeah. And... That's what he was telling me. He faxed him, sent him a fax. Right. Sent him a fax, and Bill faxed them back. In yeah. fact, I'm I'm going to see Tangerine Dream Saturday night. You're going to work. oh Tangerine Dream. Wow, that's yeah. great. And Araldo worked with. Um, uh, what's your name? Uh, the violin player. Okay, I don't the know. New, you know, Tangerine Dream's a whole new band now. You know, they're yeah. You know, uh, uh, Thorsten took over the um, Edgar Froese spot, and um, anyway, yeah. Uh, um, Araldo did some collaborations with some of them. Cool. Yeah. So um, I'm going to stop in and see them. Um, yeah. So um, outside of all that stuff, I mean, Eric McFadden isn't he from New Mexico? Yeah, you're right. He's from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in New Mexico. Yeah, I know he's a big name around here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's quite well known, actually, on the West Coast. Yeah. Um. You know, 
played in Parliament Funkadelic, played with right. War, right. knows a lot of the local musicians. I mean, I first met him, I don't know, in the early 2000s. Um, I co-produced and recorded and engineered a record with him, and he had tons of guests. He had like Kev Mo yeah. and Les right. Claypool and um, all these people. And so it's kind of cool because um, right after Prairie Sun closed, I got word from a friend of mine that another studio in San Francisco was opening. It's kind of a private studio. It's a guy, uh, a guy named Joe, Joby Pritzker, who's I don't know what business he's in, but he does well for himself. And um, he bought the house the Grateful Dead originally lived in in Haight oh, really? wow. Yeah. And he made a recording studio in the basement. Um, and um, he's good friends with Eric. And so okay. that's where we did the, um, the first recording there was that Sergeant Splendor thing I just mentioned. Right. And then we just did another, um, it's going to be an instrumental album. There's going to be some dub type stuff on it. That's with Eric McFadden, with Wally Ingram, who's a great... Okay, guy. sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, bass player named Angeline Soros. So it's all these, like, really talented... Uh, sax player named David Boyce, really phenomenal. Okay. Um, so it was nice that that thing opened up just when my other studio closed. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, people don't... Um, well, I'm sure they do, but you you kind of one of those guys that have touch so many different genres and so many different uh, acts um i didn't realize that recently you also worked with wanda jackson yeah yeah i mean i i knew the tom waits connection i knew the laswell i knew the uh, john zorn connection but wanda jackson is so separated from all that that um yeah, yeah. um well what happened was through it was through tom waits and and john hammond um the head of the Virgin Blues imprint um, was a guy named John Wooler. Okay. And John is also a producer. And so he hired me. We first did a record in um, Cuba with um, a guy named Pepecito Reyes, who at the time he was 75. Pepecito, brilliant piano player. He he was one of the co-writers of Guantanamira. So oh, he, wow. Yeah, he goes back and... Um, and then I did a bunch of other stuff with John and, and all. And one of those was the Wanda Jackson thing. And that was amazing because, you know, she's a rockabilly. She's a pioneer yep. rockabilly yep. artist. And so all these people were kind of coming out uh, to play homage to her. Um, right. Like the um, what's his name? The the bass player for Stray Cats. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, I know who you mean. Yeah. Lee, he, Lee, 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 Lee Rocker. Yeah. He came and played on a track. Uh, Dave Alvin played on a track. Didn't did Joan Jett do something with her? Who? Joan Jett. Uh, not on that record. Maybe. Oh, on okay. Record. She did one. I know she did an album with uh, Wanda. Yeah. Um, but we had the um, we had uh, Elvis Costello's drummer okay. playing playing on it, and and his name's Pete Thomas. And yeah, um, Pete Thomas. Yeah, he was a. It was a cool thing because they were rehearsing in this, um, you know, some rehearsal place. And and um, uh, this guy, Pete Thomas said, hey, you know, we went on tour with Elvis, Elvis Costello, and we only had one video we played and it was a documentary on Wanda Jackson. Right. So John yeah. Wooler, qu thinking quickly on his feet said, well, what about a duet? And so we were able to get Elvis Costello in to do a duet with Wanda on that record. Wow. And her, um, uh, what's it? Uh funnel of love that's like a classic right? yeah yeah that's a that's a help that's a rockabilly uh staple um yeah. and, and you've i mean les claypool you worked with before i know yeah you did primus and you did oyster head which yeah uh, you even got a song out of the oyster head uh deal right are yeah. you still floating yeah that's like right you see that big yeah. white thing back there yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 still floating okay great um but you know, um, it's so diverse. Gypsy Kings, uh, Ramones, yeah. Um, you know, uh, Bob Marley worked on the um, Confrontations, yeah, the remix, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. And um, how do you keep? How do you? Um, how do you keep? How do you keep sharp enough to be able to go from one, you know, from one style to another? 
Is there a trick? Is there a uh, is there a formula? What what do you use? Um, just uh, a high degree of attention and presence. Um, I I don't even um, uh, think of it as different styles because I'm thinking about the sound of it. I'm just right. trying to make things sound good, and I'm. I learned a lot from working with Bill, Bill Laswell, and it's it's more about um, rather than trying to um, force your direction on something, but just let something come to it organically, um, work more intuitively rather than trying to like structure something out. So this way, it's coming more from an instinctive, heartfelt place than it is an intellectual what do we do now? So I don't really think about it. I just sort of um, respond to what's going on and just try to go. I, I tried it. My I wrote a manifesto, a sound engineering manifesto years ago, and the basis of it was um, the effective interpretation of the artist's vision. Uh -huh. So I try to tune in to what this thing is, what they're going for, and then you know just work from there. Okay, and I'll uh, um, so like. If you're doing a Bob Marley record, you get into a Bob Marley mode, try to make it sound like Bob, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. get in, yeah, you just, yeah, you get into yeah, the yeah. reggae vibe and, yeah. yeah you you pick just, up the vibe, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Are you still doing the other seminars that you're working on? The um... um, Well, they were actually magic seminars. Yes. And, um, no, I, that, that when I did it that one time, that's the only time I've done that, but I'm still working in that area. I, I, um, so the, I have a sort of side career going outside of music, which is writing. And, um, so I had a book that just came out in July. It's called, um, uh, Lion of Light, Robert Anton Wilson on Aleister Crowley. And I was, um, a co-editor of it. I was one of the editors and I contributed a piece to it, a forward to it. Right. And uh, what the basis of that, Robert Anton Wilson um, introduced a lot of people, including myself to Aleister Crowley. I don't know if you know him. Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, Illuminatus trilogy and all that. Yeah, and yeah. Um, so what happened was is someone discovered there was a quote lost manuscript of his in the archives of Harvard university so the uh, his estate got it out of there, and it was an, uh, a manuscript on Aleister Crowley. So they made this the centerpiece of the book. It wasn't it was wasn't uh, meant to be a complete book on Crowley. It was more of an introduction. So they put uh -huh. together a bunch of other articles he'd written, got other pieces from people like myself and other experienced uh, people in that field: Lon Milo Duquette, Richard Kaczynski. Um, and then there's a couple of other people, Gregory Arnott and Michael uh, Johnson, all contributed mm -hmm. pieces to it. And um, so at the moment, that book just came out and I'm leading a, a co-leading a discussion of that at, on a uh, someone's blog. Well, I, I'm just reading um, a small biography on Crowley. He supposedly gave Winston Churchill the V for victories. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that was. I found that real interesting. That, um, you know, yeah. Well, of... Hitler was way into the occult, right. and the swastika was meant as a you know a magical symbol, and so he gave uh, Winston Churchill the V for Victory as a counter. As a counter, he, yeah, yeah. And then he, yeah. he not only gave it to him, um, but he promoted it. He went out and and yes. like you know publicized it and all that. So. Yeah, yeah, I found it real interesting that it was, um, you know, that it, it it got to that level, you know, that you yeah, know, he, you know, because I know a lot of people were, you know, I know he came from a very, very um, wealthy background originally. Yeah, and then you know, it's the whole the whole story. That's how he was able to um, finance a lot of his travels and everything. And towards the end, he was um, starting to run out of money. The inheritance was drying up. Well, it ran out quite early on because yeah. he was very lavish and yeah, he, very extravagant. He not only not only traveling, but putting out really good editions of his own writings, like yeah. you know, incredibly beautiful editions, but expensive. And yeah, he ran out of money back before World War One. He was pretty broke during World War One. Oh, really? 
Yeah, he got another small inheritance um, at the end of World War One, which he bought his uh, he bought a building in Sicily that he he called his Abbey of Thelema. Um, but he ran out of money again, and um, I mean, he basically he never had to work, you know, for someone else. Um, huh. But he would, you know, um, write to try to make money that way, and then he also had to rely on his um, followers for donations. Right. Yeah, so I mean, what what an interesting story. I mean, if, you know, if you're uh, somebody ought to be doing a, a documentary or something, something ought to be, you know. Yeah, he he was a fascinating individual. No matter you know what you think, he, he um yeah. definitely um left his mark. You know, he left his mark on on society. Well, not only that, but he left his mark on a lot of musicians. Exactly. Um, yeah, you know, on, on the arts. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know Jimmy Page. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know everybody was. Didn't yeah, Page the, buy his house or something? Yeah, he you bought know, his something. house in Northern Scotland on Loch Ness yeah. called Bullskeen. Yeah, Jimmy Page yeah. opened up an occult bookstore yeah. um, in London in the seventies, and um, and the reason he said he opened it is because he couldn't get books that he wanted in the other shops, so he opened up his own store. And it was not only a bookstore; it was a publishing company. And the first book they published was one that Crowley had put together. Um, it was um, called The Lesser Key of Solomon. Um, it has to do with um, uh, a certain kind of magic. And okay. um, and Crowley never actually wrote it. He wrote a fantastic introduction for it where he's com comparing um, what people call demons to just actually parts of your brain. So when you're like, you know, trying to bring evoke a particular demon you're really um stimulating a certain part of your brain so he was that was kind of his whole thing was to take all this occult stuff which was can sound very superstitious and uh, merge it with science right um, his, his motto was the method of science the aim of religion so right. it wasn't you know so you you would approach any kind of ritual or any kind of practice scientifically. You'd write down your observations. You'd be very skeptical about it. You know, these are experiments. They're not, you know, necessarily sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Um, but anyway, most of that book was translated by his teacher, who was a guy named McGregor Mathers, who started a group called the Golden Dawn which uh, was very influential. That's the first group Crowley joined that was influential in the late um, 19th century, early 20th century. William Butler Yeats was the most um, prominent member, but there was a lot of writers and stuff, and um, there's a whole history there. Wow. And, yeah, and that was the whole thing. That was the whole um, Crowley um mantra, so to speak, that science and religion had to meet somewhere, right? Yeah, that was that was the whole basis of everything of his stuff. Yeah, because he, he, you know, if you start getting into magic and all that, it can be, like I said, a lot of superstition, just a lot right. of kind of nonsense. And his intention was to take the nonsense out of it. And so it wasn't, you know, um, just about doing things that seem paranormal. It, it had to do with just being intentional about everyday things. So mm -hmm. he, he wrote a whole, um, his whole definition and postulates of magic um, in the same style that Euclid wrote his postulates of geometry. And um, Spinoza had written the same thing on philosophy where, you know, postulate this and um, theorem this and all that. And so he, the example he uses for magic is someone writing. And so, you know, his definition of magic is causing change to occur in accordance with will. So obviously that kind of change, it doesn't have to be like, you know, making someone fall in love with you or, or making it rain or whatever. It can be just something as simple as you want to create some music. So mm -hmm. how do you go about doing that? Well, your magic wand is your guitar and all this. He, he His example was with writing because he was a writer. So he said, you know, the, the magic wand is the pen. And I take this, you know, paper, which is another aspect of magic. And, you know, you eventually you're, you know, one of his um, postulates is that every intentional act is a magical act. 
Okay. So so magic is not only just you know something focus focus yeah 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 but it can be it's just being intentional being conscious about what you're doing like right. doing if you want to stop smoking that's magic exactly if yeah right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so yeah yeah so um yeah it's not you know making a rabbit disappear it's anything right. that's uh, yeah yeah okay cool but, yeah and and it kind of makes sense when you put it on that level that um yeah you know anything that you know anything that the mind perceives becomes you know some type of a power you know that kind of thing yeah if it's intentional as opposed to it being automatic so right. um you know so many people just react to what's given them just sort of automatically but uh -huh. if, if you're doing something consciously then that becomes was, a magical act was the old mod label um you know, those album covers and everything were they all occult based uh you would have to ask bill that i think so you see this thing i'm wearing this is a cult yeah. piece that's a, a yoko yamabe who's, who's right. bill's partner um would design these kind of um occult things yeah yeah because they always had Sigil. that uh, yeah they always had that um impact that they were you know occult based and um i, I never had the so. chance yeah i never had the chance to talk to bill about it but um it just, you know, speaking to you, it kind of uh, reminded me because, you know, you know, a lot of them are, um, I mean, they're all beautiful covers. And I know Yoko did a lot of them. And um, that's a great shirt you're wearing, too, by the way. Yeah. That's Yoko's. Yeah, this is Yoko's design. I'm pretty sure it was um, a logo for uh, uh, one of Bill's residencies at the Stone right. okay. Place, Stone Club in New York. Yeah. Wow. OK. Yeah. She's a she's an amazing designer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She does some great work. A very nice person, too. Sweetheart. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very sweet. Um, mm -hmm. So any work, are you going to be doing any more work with Bill? Anything coming down the pike? Well, um, you know, most of my stuff with Bill was was doing uh, live mixing. So yes. when that gets going, probably, I would guess. Um, the last thing we did was two shows with Buckethead last summer, almost about a year ago. That was oh, in uh, Sony, the Sony Theater. Uh, was that what it was? Yeah, I think that's what it was. It was with Blue Note, I believe. Yeah. It was in Times Square. Um, and um, But what I'm doing with Bill is um, I'm mastering a lot of the old shows, like what I just did for the Ginger Baker Band. I just did another one, same same festival actually, called Drop Zone, uh, which is Anton Fear playing drums, sure. Bill playing bass. Um, there's a Japanese percussionist named Simba and there's a, uh, Akira Sakata is playing saxophone. Peter Bratzman is playing saxophone. Yeah. So I just finished that. I sent him to him a couple of days ago. So I expect it'll be out. And so I've got, what happened was I found a DAT player that works and I've got all these recordings on, wow. on that. You know what DAT is, right? Sure. Digital yeah. tape. Yeah. Digital. Yeah. And, um, so I've got these concerts. So. So that'll be sort of my connection. The, the work I'll be doing for Bill in the in the short term is is um, transferring and then mastering these recordings. Okay, but no more. You're not going to be doing any um, studio work back in uh, on the East Coast. No, no. It's just the whole you know the whole budgets are way different these days. Yeah, so, they are. They are. Um, yeah, there's not a lot of money to fly me out. He's got an excellent engineer out there. You probably know James. Della, yeah, I know James. Yeah, Della, yeah. James. Yeah. Yeah, James is a good guy. Um, he, He's a great um, guy. He pays a lot of homage to you as well. Okay, yeah, we we work together on some stuff. Um, yeah, he was he was an intern. He told me when you were uh, when you were running the show, right? Yeah, he came in as an intern. And, yeah, that uh, was another instance of he just wrote Bill. Yeah, you know, and Bill said, "Come on out," and the rest is history. Yeah, uh, that's how I met Bill. I wrote to Bill. I said, "Hey, I want to do something with you." He said, "Okay, what do you want to do?" Right. That kind of thing, you know. He's yeah, he's very you know, open. Yeah, yeah, he is. He's, he's a great guy, and everybody who I speak to, um, that's how they met him. You know, I ran into him at a show. I said, "Hey, I do this," and he said, "Well, let me hear what you do," and uh, they hook up. You know, he hooks up with everybody. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're the you know, you're the go-to guy. So, um, how about the Les Claypool stuff? Nothing with Les. Nothing's going on. In that well, camp? no. You see, the thing with Les is that he's an engineer. Yes. Uh, the only time uh, when I got to w work with Primus, 
it was because the label, um, which was DreamWorks, I believe, some big label, said that um, they wouldn't allow him to for him to engineer that record because he had done one called the Brown Album. Yes. That had terrible reviews and didn't sound, you know, commercial or anything. So they said, OK, for your next album, we'll give you this huge budget. It was like a large budget. Um, but you stipulation, you have to use an outside engineer. You have to use outside producers. You can choose the outside engineer and producers, but, you know, you're not doing it yourself all by okay. yourself. So at that time, I was working with Tom Waits. Right. Tom Waits and Les were friends. Uh, Primus played on the Waits record I did. Yeah, and Tom Cat did. is Tom Cat, right? Something like that. Tom Cat. This is before. This is after that. This is okay. um, yeah. Tom Cat was that was where Tom was. Uh, he did a voice on a Primus song. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, and so this was. There's a song called "Big in Japan," which is on a right. Mule Japan. Variations. That was Primus. Uh-huh. And uh, Les Sub invited me over to his place and we talked. He, he said, um, he said I had the mad scientist kind of vibe. And uh-huh. what he meant by that is, you know, being able to record in unusual situations because his studio was in the pool house behind his house. And, and that's where we did a lot of the anti-pop record. And then okay. it came to, um, uh, what was it called? Um, Oysterhead. And I'm not sure how I got that gig. The gig happened because Trey Anastasio and Les and Stuart Copeland had just jammed together at the New Orleans Jazz Festival. Right. And they really liked it. And they, well, let's do a recording. And Trey's like, yeah, I can get Electra to give us a budget. So they did. And then they agreed that they wouldn't use any of their own engineers. So I guess I wasn't enough of a less engineer but I, I still got the gig i was considered outside enough to get the call for that cool. and you got a song you got a song out of it yeah that yeah. happened because the way Les writes songs is, is <laughs> he just looks around and then he sees something and he's like i'm gonna write a song about that so yeah so they were kidding me um they say they're saying ah is you know they knew about me floating and my enthusiasm and so when you get home after this, uh, are you going to go to the tank and float right away? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I sure am. I'm not going to say hello to my wife or anything. I'm just going to dump jive into the tank. Yeah. And somehow he got Oz as ever floating out of that. And then there's an interesting thing because the chorus was different. And um, it was something, the lyrics kind of don't make sense, but uh-huh. the chorus was different. Um I had after the recording, I had a rough mix and I asked for permission to play it to the people who designed the first flotation tank, who are friends of mine. Right. And they're friends with a guy named John Lilly, who you might have heard of. He's a very yes. distinguished scientist. Yeah. And Lilly was in the last, you know, few uh, months or years of his life. Like he wasn't going to he didn't live much longer after that. So I got permission for them to play him the rough mix. And in the process of asking for permission, I told Les who John Lilly was. And so Les rewrote the chorus to have John C. Lilly in there. Okay. Wow. Um, but yeah, and there's another song on that, The Armies on Ecstasy. Yes. Yeah, and that happened because there was an article in the USA Today that um, they'd found some guys in the Army who had been taking ecstasy, so... He wrote a song about it. <laughs> well, well, yeah, the, the, the talented guys. I love Stuart Copeland's drumming as well. He's a great drummer. Unbelievable. Yeah, it was yeah. so funny because at the time, um, so we, we did it in the uh, Fish studio, Trey's studio out in Vermont. Right. And um, they had no separate control room. There was just, I was just in the room and Stuart was just in front of me. And I'd put all these gobos around to try to block some of the sound. And um, all they did, the way their process of composition was just to jam for like two weeks. We had these like big reels. It was all to tape still. These super big reels of tape that you could play at 30 ips that would go over a half an hour, which most of them, the regular size is only 16 minutes. Right. And so they would just endlessly jam. And that was so cool. I mean, because like you said, Stuart's amazing and I have a front row seat to it. Now, Stuart himself at that time, he was blowing my mind, but he felt he was rusty 
because he hadn't played drum a drum kit for 10 years he'd been doing these soundtrack stuff and it was all no. programming yeah. and sampling and so he felt he was very critical of himself and this was so ironic to me but um so we would start our sessions at about two in the afternoon and go to about two in the morning and um Stuart would like get up really early like 10 o'clock or so and go in there right and start because after the after they were on tape they'd get transferred to pro tools right so we could edit them and and um i'd come in and i'd see Stuart editing and i'm like Stuart, what are you doing and i'm he's like well i'm lining up the snare drum to <laughs> you well, know i want this the snare drum's not quite right or something and well, i'm like man what are you doing man don't you know that you're Stuart?" Copeland? <laughs> yeah yeah well I, I i read his book on touring with a tree yeah, when he toured with Trey, what what a what a um like what a machine, you know? Yeah, you know, you go to your hotel room, they roll your uh, wardrobe case in, it's there for you. After yeah. the show, it's not there anymore, you know that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, an amazing, amazing how um touring changed over the years, you know. Um, yeah, I guess if you're on the road 300 days a year, though, it has to be as comfortable. Yeah, you know, it's possible, you know. So yeah. So um what are what are your plans? What's happening after all this? Um you mean today or in, in no general? in general. In general. I'm working on a book. I've been saying that for a way too long, but I'm getting back into it. It kind of took a Good. side burner during COVID. Um it's called um Music Magic and the Game of Life, Confessions of a Sound Engineer, and it combines cool. It's based on it's a memoir based on my um, music industry war stories. So it begins. Um, I wrote a preface of kind of telling the best stories as kind of like a teaser or a mm -hmm. way to sell it. And I start off with a story of um, we were recording with Buddy Miles and um, and Bernie Worrell was playing keys. What a fucking album that is. Yeah. That's yeah. the one Bill did. Yeah. Yeah. He did a couple uh, of them. Yeah, well, which was uh, Ch something changes, I think it was called. Great album. Yeah, you guys got you the only guys I know that got Buddy Miles drums right. Oh, thank you. Oh, wow. Yeah, I love that album. That's the one he does a sitting on. Um, he does sitting on top of the world, or he does. There's one where he does all along the watchtower. All along the watch. That's the one. And, yeah, there, uh, yeah, there's another classic one. Uh, Let it be me. I think it's called. Let it be me. He does the old. Yeah, he does the old uh, stacks tune. Yep. Yeah. You see, one thing people don't, well, um, people these days don't realize about Buddy is that the guy was just an amazing singer, yeah. like an incredibly soulful singer. He blew yeah. my mind. But the story I tell is, um, so we were done with that session and Umar bin Hassan uh, was doing a solo record that, that Bill did, you know, it was eventually called Bebop or Be Dead. It was on Axiom. Um, but Omar, Omar came in, came in, I was breaking down the drum mics and he says, yeah, I just wrote this new piece. Do you want to hear it? And, and Bill's like, yeah, sure. And, and so he starts, um, uh, reading off the, these, this yellow legal pad of his notes. And, um, you know, all of a sudden Buddy starts going back to the drum kit and Bernie goes over to the organ and they start like, you know, playing to what, what Omar's. Uh, reciting and so I realized what's happening I stopped breaking down the drum mics I put up some tape and then I got um, Umar in front of our, our vocal mic which was already set up and you know let's take it from the top and they recorded it the song is called love it's a beautiful explores you know various dimensions of love and they did it one take and um, there was no overdubs or anything that was the that's what's on the album so the first, my first big project of Bill's own stuff was the Material Seven Souls. Great and, album. Yeah. And you know, that was originally, the songs were originally earmarked for the second Pill album. Oh, really? Yeah. And that's when um, uh, uh, Lydon and Bill met and had a big falling out. Okay. And, um, you know, because Bill, again, he, he wanted, you know, he thought he could bring more to it than what Lydon could bring to it. And, and right. um, so they had a yeah. part of the ways. And so Bill used those, 
tracks that had already started, I believe, and then he got William Burroughs. William Burroughs did the, uh, yeah, great. I think that's one of the greatest albums that he did. Yeah. And I think it's an, that's an, I, I play that one whenever I want to hear something by Bill, like that's my first instinct right. to get to that album. Yeah. Brilliant album. And I love your album. Oh, you do? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That was um, very interesting. In fact, um, I remember getting that maybe it's probably 20 years ago now, right? Yeah. It's, yeah, getting, I think it's more than 20. Yeah. 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 I'm it's surprised. been a while. I remember yeah. listening to it, man. It was, um, it just took you all over the world, you know, in one sitting, you know, it was, it was great. Yeah. The different, you know, the different flavors. Um, and I got it because, you know, I know, I knew you through Bill. Yeah, Bill was a big supporter of that. The reason I got the deal was basically through Bill because he, he connected yeah. me with Sub Rosa. Right, right, right. But it was, I, I know, I thought it was a brilliant uh, outing. Thank you. And um, yeah, so what do you want to, what do you want to tell people before we leave? Where do we find all your stuff? Um, you know, I don't know. I sort of almost don't even, um, bother with that. Um, you know, I let people find it on their own. I mean, okay. um, um, you know, I'm really trying to focus on the writing and, um, uh, if they want to check out the Crowley discussion, I can like send you a link Please. You know, for it. Um, and what else? Um, yeah, this ginger baker, ginger, black ginger. It was so funny. I just did this ginger baker band. And then the next thing I got was ginger, black ginger. That's the Belgian free jazz thing. Okay. Um, so I have a blog also. I, I, another thing I've been doing, I'm into this philosopher named Gilles Deleuze, which yeah. in my opinion, he was almost like a, a hermetic secret agent that infiltrated the ph world of philosophy because really? um, he he went that whole route, and I did. I have a YouTube channel where I um, I'm a, going through one of his books called The Logic of Sense, which is his most difficult book, and I'm explaining it. The only reason I started doing that is because I there weren't any tutorials on it, and the ones that were there would really stray off the subject and start talking about other things. They wouldn't sort of tell you how to penetrate this book, so I I started a YouTube channel based on that logic of sense his definition of the word sense is not just like meaning or linguistic meaning but sense is like the life force or what makes things you know be alive the sort right. of vitality behind it all um i could send you a link to that channel please do yeah and um yeah you know you know the reason i mean i actually don't do a lot of these things because i just sort of there's a lot of time management in my life i'm trying to get straight like with the whole change in the business there's a ton of like writing emails and texts and all that and i find that takes away from like my writing and all that so um but i wanted to do your thing because i'm really bad at promoting myself <laughs> and and so you asked me where do i they find it? and i don't even answer have an answer for that right, you know? right. so um yeah, I don't know. I don't. Uh, yeah, I'll just okay. send you all that stuff. And 